In this video, you will learn how to transform a loop-based algorithm so that it uses recursion instead of a loop. You will then learn how to cache the results of this recursive algorithm using memorization to greatly simplify the time complexity of the newly made recursive algorithm. So that you can get a good grasp of these principles, we will be using two examples throughout the tutorial's runtime. Those algorithms will be the ubiquitous Fibonacci and factorial algorithms, respectively. Both of them are classic algorithms that work well with the focus of this tutorial due to their list-like nature. It also means that this tutorial will be easily translatable into other languages. So for this tutorial, I will be using JavaScript, but you shouldn't have any trouble translating it into your own language of choice because these algorithms are so widely covered. But before we begin with the development process, it is important that we first cover the basics so that everyone can be on the same page before the main tutorial begins. Now there's a lot of confusion over what recursion is, but all it is is getting a function to call itself. Because of this, it is useful for the same things that loops are useful for. That is carrying out lots of repeated tasks. In fact, there is nothing that we can do with loops that we can't do with recursion and vice versa. That being said, recursion can be nicer to use in certain scenarios than loops because of its multiplying nature. This makes recursion an app choice when traversing through a tree because when visually graphed, the way that recursive algorithms operate is very similar to the structure of tree data structures. For example, if we called a function that inside called itself twice recursively, then from this single function call, two more function calls of the same function will be triggered. Then from these two children function calls, two more function calls will be called from each one giving us four function calls from two. These four function calls will then multiply to call eight more function calls and so on and so forth. The tree will continue to grow and grow until what is known as a base case is met. This is simply an if condition inside of the function that prevents any more recursive function calls from being invoked. All recursive functions need a base case. It is not an option. If it is missing, then the call stack, which is where the language manages function calls, will get overrun by an unabating influx of recursive functions, leading to a stack overflow, which is bad news for us because it means application crash. So we have a function here that calls itself. It will not do anything unless we call it, so we will. We have just caused a stack overflow for the aforementioned reasons. This function will be called and called with no end in sight until our application crashes from not being able to handle this many functions being called at the same time. The solution, as previously stated, is to include a base case. To do this, we will create a variable that will be incremented on each function call, but before the function calls itself. It is important in order for the base case to work that the variable is incremented before the function calls itself. The base case will be the counter being greater than 4. Therefore, the function will only be called a total of five times. For the fifth time, the return keyword will be met and the function will be exited out of before it has managed to call itself again for the sixth time. As you can see, we can now run our code free of any errors. If we wanted to return a value though, like a string in this case, then we would currently be unable to. As you can see, we are hitting run but are not seeing our value in the console like we would if it was being returned. The reason for this is because the core stack works by piling functions on top of each other. This means that the most recent function, the one that actually returns a string, will end up as the uppermost function on the core stack with the very first function, the one that started the recursion cycle at the very bottom. Functions inside of the core stack are waiting to be called. When they are called, they will be removed, one at a time starting with the uppermost function and working downwards until every function is cleared. So whilst this uppermost function may return a value, its value is soon negated because it is the first one to be wiped off the core stack along with its value before all of the other functions are called. Because the uppermost and final function is the only one that returns a value, when we get to the bottom function, there is nothing to return and so ultimately nothing is returned to the console. The solution is to make each function return the recursive function that it in self invokes. This will give the bottommost function something to return that something will be the chain of functions that ultimately lead to the hello world string, meaning that if all is going well, it should end up as the final value returned. As you can see, we are getting back the string, so things are working as they should. As for memorization, that refers to the practice of caching a function's return value when its output is determined by its input parameters. 
This will mean that if our input parameters are the same as the prior function call, then our function won't actually perform any new operations. All it would do is fetch the previously calculated value and return that instead. As you can imagine, this is a huge saver on time complexity. It means that we won't have to calculate anything that we haven't previously calculated. As you can imagine, for things like the Fibonacci sequence, this is extremely useful because the sequence itself is constant, meaning the first 10 items will always be the same. Therefore, we will only use processing power to calculate new items in the sequence and not waste those resources on calculating the first couple of items that we would otherwise be calculating over and over again. So here we have a function coupled with an object that will store the function's cache data. The purpose of this function is to merely add 10 to whatever value was passed into the function and then return that value. We have passed in 10 and so have gotten 20 returned. This particular 10 plus 10 calculation will only occur on the first time that I run this function. The next time I run it, this if condition will be met and the value returned will come straight from memory already pre-calculated for us. If I was to change the value of n however, and pass in new data into this function, then you would calculate a new value because we have yet to pass 5 into the function. The problem with this current example is the fact that I am storing data in global scope unnecessarily. This is bad practice because global scope should only be used when it is really necessary to do so, which it isn't here. The solution is to use a JavaScript closure. Closures in JavaScript allow us to make global scope data private. We have obviously made some changes, but as you can see, things are still working fine like they were before. For starters, memorization is now no longer a function. It is a variable that is assigned to a function. It is important that we write the function as we do, wrapped in parentheses and with a pair of parentheses at the end. This will call the function immediately on initial document load. We want this behavior because that is the time where all global scope variables get initialized. If this function wasn't initialized on initial document load, then it would cease to behave like a JavaScript closure. So on initial document load, this anonymous function will be called, cache will be initialized and the return keyword will be met. This keyword will assign this nested function to the value of the memorization constant. Therefore, when we call memorization here, we are actually calling the nested function, not this parent function. The special thing about it is that this nested function can have access to data declared inside of this parent function when no other parts of the application can. Thus a closure has been made. With theory out of the way, it is time to begin working on the algorithms. We will start with the Fibonacci sequence. The first version will be made using a standard loop without recursion or memorization. You could think of this as the iterative method. It is the most common way of creating the algorithm. With theory out of the way, it is time to begin working on the algorithms. We will start with the Fibonacci sequence. The first version will be made using a standard loop, without recursion or memorization. You could think of this as the iterative method. It is the most common way of creating the algorithm. Oh, by the way, if you are wondering what IDE I am currently using, it is called Repolit. It is useful because it gives us a handy JavaScript console, easily accessible on the right of the screen. It also gives me an easy way to share code with others, in particular the code for this project, which the link to it will be posted in the description box below if you want to play around with it for yourself. We will write out the start of the Fibonacci sequence for reference. Remember, every number is the sum of the previous two numbers in the sequence. This n parameter will be the index of the number in the Fibonacci sequence that we want returned. These two are self-explanatory. The Fibonacci sequence will always start with these two values. We will ensure that they are returned if the user has requested them. As for the other indexes, they will be dealt with iteratively in this loop. The parameter n has to be at least two in order for this loop to run. Two translates to the third item in the Fibonacci sequence, the first item that isn't covered by these two variables, hence why it is the first item to be generated via this loop. The answer is generated from the sum of the previous two numbers and then the previous two numbers are updated to move the sequence along so that another number can be calculated on another iterative cycle. Okay, now to give you a quick demonstration just to prove that it does work, we'll get the seventh item from the Fibonacci sequence. Yep, so we've got a back 13, so as you can see, 0, because we start counting at 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. 
This is the value that we do want returns, that's good. So now we go on to the more interesting stuff because it's time to create the recursive algorithm. We'll get rid of this because we don't need it anymore. And then we'll say function. In being less than two will serve as our base case as well as being part of the algorithm. This is because the first two items in the sequence, zero and one, are always the same as the index values anyway. Therefore, if those indexes were requested, then we can simply return the index as the value. Furthermore, if this condition is met, then the method will be ended here because this return keyword will be met. Therefore, we won't have a chance to invoke another function because the method just ends here. So therefore, it's our base case. This is the completed function. As you can tell, it is a lot simpler than the iterative method. That being said, it can be harder to wrap your head around than the iterative version, so allow me to explain. Essentially what is happening here is a tree-like structure that is being created. Each function will call itself twice and return the sum of both of those function invokes. This means that by the time our bottommost function is removed from the stack, the Fibonacci number that we requested will be returned. Take this example where we requested the index of 7 from the sequence using the recursive algorithm. The bottommost function on the stack, which is also the one that starts the recursive cycle, will invoke two more functions. These can be thought of as child nodes on a tree. Since one of them is one index less than the requested index, and the other is two indexes less than the requested index, they will hold the following Fibonacci values, since we requested the Fibonacci number at the index of seven. These nodes will continue sprouting off child nodes until we get to these leaf nodes here, these leaf nodes will either hold the Fibonacci numbers at position 1 or 2. That is because of our base case. It prevented any function with an index of 0 or 1 from invoking itself again. Instead we made it return its own end parameter because we know that the first two items in the Fibonacci sequence match their indexes 0 and 1 respectively. These two values 0 and 1 are essential for this recursion cycle to work properly. The final value returned will work off of their values. Each of the parent nodes will calculate the return values, starting from the bottom up. So by the time we get to the uppermost function, the function that will return the final value will have a value that represents the Fibonacci number at the index requested. So just to demonstrate to you that this will work, we will do the same one. We will request 7 again, and hopefully we should get the same value, 13. Yes, as you can see, it's working well. But the problem with this function is its extremely burdensome time complexity. You see, if we wanted the number held in the Fibonacci sequence at index 7, then after that, we wanted the number held in the sequence at index 8, then we would have to calculate all previous 7 numbers, just to see this new number at the index of 8. This is extremely wasteful, not to mention makes things almost impossible to work out when it comes to calculating numbers that are in the higher end of the Fibonacci sequence. You see, currently this recursive algorithm has a time complexity of 2 to the power of n, which is right up here in this red zone on the bigger complexity chart. The reason for this is because unlike loops, where each operation happens sequentially one after the other, our current recursive algorithm is spouting off two more function cores for every function core. This means stacks upon stacks of functions getting piled on top of each other, all meant to be happening at the same time. The more numbers we are calculating, the heavier demand will be. As you can imagine, memorization will do wonders to the type of recursive algorithm that we're currently dealing with. In fact, it will reduce the time complexity to all the way down here, which is called linear time. So here is how it works. Like with before, we will set up our closure so that this cache object can only be accessed by our algorithm. So if we get to this first else block because there's no key value pair on the cache object and the desired index is not less than 2, then we will calculate our desired Fibonacci sequence number. But as soon as we do, its value will be stored and indexed inside of this cache object. This saves up on time complexity at a slight cost of some added memory complexity since we have to store more data in memory now. Because once a Fibonacci sequence number has been calculated, we will never have to calculate it again, even if its value is needed elsewhere in this tree-like structure. In fact, a lot of this tree structure can now be crossed out, as you can see. There are now no repeated calculations in this tree. We only need one, the rest can be crossed out because we can just access the value from memory. With all of this finished, we end up with our recursive Fibonacci sequence algorithm, with a time complexity of linear time. So we'll run it again. It should still work as you can see it is working 
and we'll remove it because we're now going to move on. And by this point, you should be getting hang of recursion and memorization. We will go through one more example so that you can see these concepts being used in a different scenario. That scenario in question will be this factorial algorithm. Again, if you don't know what factorial is, as represented in maths by this exclamation mark, then it is just the sum of all the integers multiplied together, starting from a chosen number and ending at 1. We will be going through this algorithm quicker than the previous one because there is less to it. But as you can see, this n parameter will have to hold a value that is greater than 1 for this loop to be called. If it isn't, then the value returned will be 1 by default. And yes, apparently 0 factorial is 1 for some reason. But we have made it like this because a number multiplied by 1 isn't going to affect its final value. We only want the sum of it being multiplied by all numbers starting from 2 and going up to the number itself. And this syntax here is shorthand for itself times by i, just in case you're wondering. But it's probably better to write it how it was before, just because it's a lot quicker that way. We will be implementing the memorized algorithm and the recursive algorithm at the same time for this one. You should already have a basic understanding of how they work, but don't worry, we will go over them one more time. Although I will say beforehand that memorization is less beneficial for this algorithm in comparison to the Fibonacci algorithm. That is because the time complexity for this algorithm is already linear time, as we are not recursively calling more than one function, like we were previously with the Fibonacci algorithm. The memorization works in a similar vein to what we have done previously, so I won't mention it this time. As for recursion is concerned, the base case is met when n is equal to 2. We do this because 2 factorial is simply 2. If we requested a larger number though, then when the base case is met, the function below the uppermost function will now have a number to work off of, which is the number 2. This function will have an n parameter of 3 because of the way that we have designed the algorithm to subtract 1 by n's value on each new function invoke. Therefore, this function directly below will return 6 because 2 times 3 is 6 and 3 factorial is also 6. If we have requested a number larger than 3 factorial, then there will be at least one more function below the function. In the stack, these functions will continue working out their values until all functions are removed and a final value is returned. So again, one more time, we're just going to check to see if this works. So we'll try out 3 and then we'll click run. And yes, as you can see, it is working. Try out a larger number, 5. Pudgeon 20, again, you can lock this up, but that is correct. We've now reached the end of the video. I hope that you have a clear understanding of how recursion and memorization to very important topics work. If you still don't understand or have any queries regarding the two algorithms that we have covered in this video, then please don't hesitate to post these comments down in the comments box below. It would be my pleasure to answer any questions that you might have. Likewise, you would be doing me a huge favour if you considered liking and subscribing. Any help that you would be able to give me would be greatly appreciated. Anyway, I hope that you have a great day and peace out.